1 John 4, 7 and 8, one of my favorite scriptures in the Bible, and I think it's applicable to what I want to say this morning and, and do if I can keep my eyes clear. I've just been at the point of tears all night long just uh, thinking about these things because there's a personal part of it with a friend of mine, and we'll get to that um, um, in a minute, in just a second, actually. Um, but uh, John says this, Beloved, <clears throat> let us love one another. I mean, that could be the Bible right there and done. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. He said, in case you're not quite up to speed, love is of God. And everyone that loves, I want you to get this, everyone that loves or has love is born of God. So if you feel any measure of love, it is the birth of Christ in your heart. It is that DNA, that courageous love, so courageous that God sent his son to be an example. And everyone that loves is born of God, and listen to this, and knows God. He that does not love does not know God. That's hard. That's really tough. He didn't say that he that does not love or she that does not love is not going to heaven or is not saved or is not going to have eternal life or God doesn't love. It says he or she that does not <coughs> love doesn't really know God. We're not a friend of God. Love is the nexus. Love is the glue. Love is the connection. Love is the link to knowing God. You'll never know God if you don't master the love of God. Never know it. And the hard part is, I love God. He's easy to love. It's the people he made. That's the problem. Someone was, used to say to a, a friend of mine, used to say, gosh, I love church if people didn't show up, including him. I thought, I was thinking, well, you're, you probably should stay home too. He was the pastor. But anyway, so <laughs> that's just this. So, so, so I, want to, I want to give you some sound bites on that and talk to you about um, three sound bites of the love of God and the life of Jesus and a conclusion. But before I want to tell you a story, I want to tell you how, partly how um, this narrative was weaved into my life. And um, it was um, somewhere probably 1990, no, 88, 89. I was doing a camp uh, conference in Kansas, uh, Missouri, actually Kansas City. And I don't remember how it came about, but uh, someone had told me about an old prophet at the time, it was a younger prophet. But there's a prophet there that they want me to meet. And, you know, anybody that wants to introduce you a prophet, you probably should go because you may profit from that. But uh, I thought, yeah. So uh, they said his name was Bob Jones. I'd never heard of that, Bob Jones. Who's Bob Jones? And I heard this. I knew I needed to go. They said, you're from, you're from Arkansas, right? Those are, he's from the Ozarks of Missouri. And I thought, oh, boy, oh, brother, where art thou? But anyway, so, so I thought, I haven't met him yet, but I know I'm going to like him because he's going to talk like me. And he did. So they take me to his house. So 1988, 89, before 90, I can't remember the exact year. Little teeny house there, and Viola, his wife, was there. And this little guy, this unassuming little guy, kind of a big guy, short, and uh, met me at the door and... and uh, we sit down, he began to talk. He began to tell me uh, uh, a story. And he began to tell me that how, and uh, August, uh, excuse me, in uh, 1975, he died. He had died twice in his life. He got struck by lightning in the Ozarks in the basement, opened the refrigerator door to get the Coke out. And he died. So twice he's died and come back. But he, because this is what brought him to this. He said to me, he looked at me, and he says, boy, you got a big old spirit of rejection on you. I said, I do not. He said, yes, you do, because you just proved it right there. Oh, well, well, I'm not. And so he said, well, cast that thing out of you. I thought, man, I don't know. I wish I had that gift to cast it out. But I argued with him, and he said, the fact that you're arguing with me tells me you got it. You need to get rid of it. So I go, okay, 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 I, I, I'm good. And uh, so long story short, that was kind of the beginning. It was a little rocky, and it's like, so he, he laid, you know, hands on me and took me out to his old pickup truck, a Chevy truck, stars shining, laid hands on me and prayed for me, which is really sweet. Went back in the house, and he said, can I tell you a story? 
And so uh, he said, he told me this story. He said, on August the 8th, 1975, now this is 1988, he said, I died and went to heaven. And um, he said, as I'm in heaven, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, he said, I'm standing in two lines. I'm not there, but I'm in a gateway to the next life. So he must have been somewhere between dead and not dead and, and, and uh, kind of like I felt yesterday, but somewhere between those two things, those two parallels. And he said, but I'm standing in this long, 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 long line. And what, what, what is that? <laughs> it's not working. There we go. Do I need to start over? Probably not. You got most of it? Okay, good. Because I don't want to do it twice. And um, so he... He is, um, let me turn this one off. Um, yeah, there you go. So he said, I want to tell you this story and, um, about the, um, something that happened to me in 1975. And I knew there was a purpose for him because I knew we would be lifetime friends because I liked him instantly because he was a hillbilly. That's one reason. And so we were blood brothers. But, um, and... Um, he older than me at the time. I was in my, what, late 30s. And um, <clears throat> he said, I'm standing in line. There were two lines. And I'm standing in line trying to get into heaven. He said, I'm dead. So he said, I saw the line. And in my line, I look all the way down the line, and there's just people lined up, and Jesus is standing in the front of the line. And the other line, he said, went to another place. This is a conveyor belt. He told me some stuff. He said, you don't want to know what was on that conveyor belt. But it was, it was other people, and they were horrible looking. They were, their faces were contorted. He said it was, they were in pain and suffering. He said, he said that, that, that line you don't want to be in. But I'm in this line, and as I'm in this line, he said, I'm looking, and I'm trying to figure out what's going on up there, and Jesus is standing there, and every person that steps up, he bends over and whispers in their ear. And if they would shake their head, no, they had to go. They had to leave the line. And if they shake their head, yes, to the question he was asking them, he would open his robe and his arms, and they would disappear into his heart, through his heart, into the next life, into the throne of God in eternity. I thought, wow. So he, his heart was a portal for the right answer to the question. So he said, I was thinking, what would that be? And said, and the line got shorter and I'm getting closer. Every time, every person would step up, he would whisper in their ear. And if they said yes, he would open his robe and they would disappear in his heart. And um, he said, I'll never forget the one before me, two people before me was this black lady that would look like a choir singer in a church. And she was so happy. Boy, she was so happy when she got there and asked him, and she just jumped through. And so he said, so I'm next. And I'm thinking, I wonder what's going on here, what, what's going to happen with me. He said, and I bend over, and the Lord says this in my ear, whispers to me, while you on earth, did you learn to love? That was the question. What other reason were you there other than that, apparently? While you were on earth, the time I gave you on earth, did you learn to love? And Bob said, I couldn't say I did. I said, no, Lord. And the Lord said, you have to go back and learn. You can't come here. For a lot of our sakes, including mine, he was turned away. And he continued to talk to me about the love of God. And uh, the most loving man I loved, the most encouraging man I ever met. He never saw anything in anyone that wasn't redeemable. No matter who you are or how weird or bad or whatever you are, he'd go, oh, that's good. He just would turn any, he would spin any problem in your life to any deficit to a positive. He was amazing. He loved little kids. And he used to tell me one, uh, once that uh, my, my, my goal, when I meet men, if they don't like babies, little puppies, I don't like them or they're not going to heaven. So that's so what I loved about Bob. <laughs> and so... Uh, 
So we did a lot of ministry together through the years. And God, what an amazing, he was such a father. And he was a father to me. And um, I miss him terribly. And uh, so <clears throat> he fell sick about, um, what, uh, 12 years ago. And um, when he was really sick and he was really sick and hot, Laura and I went to the hospital and um, Charlotte to visit him. And Bob, the doctor, said um, he'll never make the morning. He will not live through the morning. And this is what I love. This is what I love about this man. And the doctor said in his little weak voice, they, uh, they told him, you're not going to live. He said, he said, he said, Ain't no doctor going to tell me when I'm going to die, when I, I'll darn well die when me and the Lord get ready. <laughs> you got to be Marcus Saul to talk like that and say those kind of stuff. Well, he didn't. Next morning, he was still there. The next week, he was still there. And so he kind of crippled through some things for a while. And then he, as I've said before, he called me personally. Probably, I must have been. I don't know how many, a week or so before he passed away, later, when he decided that the Lord and him decided they were going to die, not a doctor. And, and one of the things he told me, uh, too, is uh, you can never stop loving people, Larry. If you do, you're done. You, you know, your purpose on life, you have no other purpose. And he told me to fight for my life and to fight to, to stay alive and to never stop loving people. And the caveat to that, and I'll move on, is he died that year, 2014, not that long ago. Guess what day? Valentine's Day. You can't just make that up. It's like, Bob, that's amazing. It's like, what? You're going to do a movie. It's like, Bob, incredible. I miss uh, Bob. I really miss, I miss being around somebody that loved everybody. I miss being around somebody that worked tirelessly to encourage people and to pull people together and to see the best in people when they were acting the worst. And it just, he was everybody's friend. I love that very much. And um, I think of him a lot, very often. And um, he, um, he, he set a narrative as... Many other fathers in my life have said that is, that is forever with me. It has high priorities. And listen, I don't, and let me move on from this. I don't, I don't want to finish this life and stand in the line and have to say, no, I didn't do that. I didn't because that, I, I don't want to do that because then I perhaps miss my purpose for even being here. So, again, for God so loved the world, I thought this was interesting. It's hard for us to even love the church and each other sometimes, or it is for me sometimes, because people are people. But God, he wouldn't even talk about the church or his people, just the world, the crazy. For God so loved the world that he gave, because love always gives, love doesn't take. There was a young man when I was hanging out with Russ Taft, Larry Days, that used to hang around. He wrote a song called, uh, You're Either Two Things, A Taker or a Giver. And I thought that song always stuck with me. We never we sang it one time, or I didn't, but somebody else sang it. But there's two kinds of people. There's takers and givers. And givers give love. And I don't know what takers take, but uh, don't want to be a taker. So let me give you three sound bites about the love of God and the life of Jesus. Because he exemplified everything that I just said. And he was sent by his father as a gift to the world to love the world. And he loved little children. He loved the Pharisees, although he spanked them now and then. He loved Peter, who was a mess and a half. He loved people who were you know, fly, flying crazy. He loved, he just, he was the exemplification, the personification of the love of God. Why? Because he knew God. And he said that, I know him who has sent me. So love was preeminent in his life. So one, let me give you three sound bites and a, and a conclusion. And then a final conclusion. Number one, Jesus embraced love as the touchstone of his destiny. Love, the love of God in Jesus' life was a touchstone of his destiny. It was a thing that was so important to him. It, it, it ran the narrative in his life. Everything he did was about that. 
about the, it, whether it was the whether it was the old or the young or the little kids that he brought on his lap, and they sat there and the disciples are angry with him and they didn't know why is he doing his little kids and basically told them you guys, you guys got to got to grow up for such is the kingdom of God, the love of God. But he demonstrated God's love for people. It doesn't just happen; it's intentional. And I don't know if you know it. I have learned it by now, but loving people doesn't just happen. You just don't see someone or have a, um, a connection with someone and go, I don't know why. It just, I can't help it. It just happens. No, most of my life, love is intentional because love is a choice. It's not particularly an emotion. And so Jesus loved the Pharisees who tried to kill him and those who were, who were blaspheming him, he didn't love them. I don't think it just happened. It was intentional. He had an intentional bias toward the love of God, and he could never falter and didn't falter that to his very death. When he died, he said to those that were killing him, forgive them, Lord. They don't understand what they're doing. He set such a high bar for the church that two, you say, how come Jesus hadn't come back yet? Because we've yet to even reach that bar, and he's hoping, I believe, for a generation that will come to that place of the love of God, the intentional love of God. So he demonstrated God's love is not, or does not happen. It's intentional. So say it one more time. It's intentional. It's a choice. There's nothing in your life that's not a choice. Emotions are great, but emotions will fool you. Emotions will trick you. Emotions are Listen, you have to make choices, and the choices had to be tethered to the Scripture, the Word of God, and the nature and the heart of God, the DNA of God. Okay, two. He proved that loving people is not merely an emotion, but it's a character choice. Love is a character choice, and Jesus proved that. Number three. Because you can have power without love. You can have charisma. You can be gifted. You can be amazing without love. But you can't have love without power because it's arbitrarily there. I don't know if you got that. Let me put it the way. Your character must be proportional to or greater than the charisma in your life. Your character... And the, and the love of God, and your character, because love is character. I mean, the character, that's, that's a character trait. Love is a character trait. It must be greater than your gifting, than your, than your, than your charisma, a charisma, than your supernatural expression. Supernatural expression, yes, that's what we want. Supernatural gifting, yes, what we want. But their birth, their birth out of not just merely your emotion but a decision of character. Spiritual gifts and ministry and purpose in life that we should have for achievement and doing stuff and being who we are, that's great. And gifting from God, it, it, it's, it's freely given to us. It costs nothing. That is charisma. Charisma is the gifting of God. Gifts of the Spirit that we all are yearning for, or I wonder whether it be a gift of prophecy, gift of healing, gift, things we work for, things we really are called to, and rightfully so. They're not, you don't buy them. You don't, do, you don't do anything to deserve them. They're gifts. The word gifts means you get a gratuity that's cost you nothing. So all that you're chasing right now has already been given to you, so stop chasing it and get and just take it. However, you can have power, as I said, without love, but not love without power. So spiritual gifts are freely given, but I want you to get this. this is, that, that's the easy, spiritual gift. The supernatural, the prophetic is the easiest thing in my life. Preaching is the easiest thing. That, the, the, the healing is the easiest thing. The supernatural has always been, the, here's the hardest thing, spiritual fruit. Oh, because gifting comes overnight. Fruit takes a lifetime to develop. Oh, that's the hard. It took me to my mid-30s and 40s and meeting people like Bob and many, many others and God doing me and living. Now, it took me a long time to figure out the difference between the two. You can be an absolute jerk and be the most anointed person in the room because anointing and gifting is not equal to character always. Should be a flow from character, but sometimes 
it is just a gift. It's a gratuity. It's, it's, a, it's free. It's from God. However, spiritual fruit, such as love, is powerfully, excuse me, did I say powerfully? Wrong word. It's painfully cultivated in the soul of life experience as a believer. So why has God put you with certain people? To help you painfully cultivate a fruit of the Spirit that is not free or given to you that you have to learn with character to develop. Love tops everything. I mean, I mean, it did. you could just, just wrap Christianity, wrap who we are up in one verse, John 3, 16. For God, that's who he is. For God so loved that he gave the most precious thing to him. Do you think it was like a big joy thing he did? I mean, to watch this happen, but he so loved that he did that. Okay, number two. Jesus demonstrated that love is the art of giving. The love of God is the art of giving. Love that doesn't give. Let me tell you. Love that you have that doesn't give sacrificially, love that doesn't, is probably a religious, a religious illusion in your head. Love that doesn't give. The love that doesn't express itself in giving and taking the low and preferring others is probably just a religious illusion uh, in your head. Not a tangible force in your heart. I knew I should have went to the other church and preached this, but that's all right, because you guys probably got this fine. So, I said it, I'll say it again. God so loved the world, not just the church. You know what? Sometimes I think it's easier to love the sinner than it is the believer. Because we have, we're close quarters with each other and we see each other's flaws. And, and, the, and the idiot downtown, you only see his smile. So I think it's harder to live with family. It's harder to be family. It's harder to love each other in that context than it is to love somebody, you know, that you don't uh, know. Because, you know, can I, can I say this? I, I've said it before. I want you to hear it. The only heroes we have as Christians are people we don't know very well. The only people usually that we just are enamored with and love and like, my God, are usually people that we don't know we just see in the pulpit or see online or see in the conference or see their gifting. I don't know about you, but once you get to know someone, it's just a little harder to keep the love of God motivated in your life. <laughs> Especially if you're looking in the mirror. Jesus lived to give. His unconditional love for people was a tangible force in motion. Now, I want you to get this. How was it in motion? Every charisma gifting that flowed out of Jesus began in the DNA, the embryo of the love of God. It began with that. Let me give you one scripture. You know this scripture? When the sick were in the, around him in the multitudes there, this is what the scripture said, and Jesus being moved with compassion then healed the multitudes. Love was the driver for the anointing of supernatural power in his life. It should be. It has to be. It's the only way it can work. You, can't, you, you flip the narrative around. You get away with it for a while, but it will bite you in the end, and you will have to answer the question, did you learn to love? First Corinthians 14 puts it this way, about prophecy and prophetic gifts. Um, he talked about, you know, uh, what, desiring spiritual gifts in 1 Corinthians uh, uh, chapter uh, 14. Uh, but how did he begin that narrative? What did he say? Get to, if you never put this in order, in chronological order, he says this, hey, I got to talk to you about the power of God and your ministry and supernatural gifting. But before I do, he said, pursue love. Well, Paul starts out about this expose 
about this thing he's going to talk to the church about to encourage them, which we should be powerful, which we should prophesy, which we should speak in tongues, which we should heal sick. He said, I want you, to, I want you to, uh, to desire what he was going to say. What he did say was, I want you to fervently desire to chase the, the gifts of the Spirit, prophecy, especially prophecy. But he said, he put, he said a, a clause, a disclaimer in front of that. He said, first, before you even try that, try pursuing love first because it will be a lot easier for you. Let me put it in context. Pursue love, King James, 1 Corinthians 14. 1. Pursue love and then desire spiritual gifts, especially prophecy. Why? For he that prophesies speaks unto men, back to love, for edification, exhortation, and comfort. He said if you're looking for a gift, you want one that's really good, try prophecy because it encourages people. That's a good one. So if you're under anointing somewhere where a prophetic person gives you a word that's not encouraging, I probably wouldn't receive it. That's what I loved about Bob. Everything he said had in his DNA and his core the potential for the love of God to encourage you into who you were, no matter how bad you looked or how bad you acted. Okay. Jesus lived to give. And I said that. Remember the raising of Lazarus from the dead? Remember that? People think about that, like Martha and Mary, I believe, or some of his closest friends and their brother Lazarus was dead or dying. He was sick. Jesus was holding a crusade somewhere in downtown Nashville at the time, or, or L.A., where he was at, I don't know, but it was a big deal. There was a lot of stuff going on there. Cameras were there. Everybody was there. CNN was there. Yeah, it was like, I don't know who was there, but, but that's the Corinthians network, by the way. So anyway, so they, and they say, send a word to him, he who you love is sick. And the scripture says, and, and unto death, but Jesus tarried and stayed longer. Have you ever felt like that? Where you said, Lord, I'm going to die here. And he's like, I'm busy. I mean, this is his friend. And he said, Jesus finally, finally they come to him and say, never mind, Master, you don't have to come because he's like, done. He's gone. But Jesus comes and he comes to Martha and Mary's house and their brother, his friend, who is in the tomb. And he's watching their crying and this, get this. This is who Jesus was. This is how he's in touch with his emotions. And his emotions was the ground floor, was the ground swell. It was the launching pad for the power of God. He said, in Jesus, get this, most powerful two words in the scripture, and Jesus wept. He didn't weep because there's nothing to do about it. He wept because of his friend having to go through that. And Martha and Mary, who he loved, how they were hurt. And Jesus wept. What did he do? Out of that love of God, out of that weep, he performed a miracle that raised a man from the dead. If you want to raise some from the dead, if you want to raise the dead, you need to weep a lot for people. You need to have a heart that is tender and a heart that cannot stand to see destruction in their life. He wept, and not only that, he wept because he loved Martha and Mary and they were so hurt. He wept over their hurt in their life as well. And he said, I can, I can imagine his booming voice and tears running down his face. And he screamed, Lazarus, come forth. Like, you don't have a choice. Love calls you forth. Compassion calls you forth. And you know the story. Lazarus comes out um, of the grave and is raised from the dead. And he and Jesus and Martha and Mary start traveling together. Today it would have been Peter, Paul, and Mary, but... Never mind. So, hold on. So, I can never miss an opportunity to say something stupid, so that's fine. Just <laughs> My mind works that way. I'm working on living in two worlds. But anyway, it's the only thing that keeps me insane. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, true ministry is a passion of heart. Not a gift you learn. Not something someone lays down to you and parts to you. Or something you decide 
that you won't. But by the way, true ministry is a passion of heart and it's the supernatural motion, not empty words in your mouth. Ministry is passion, our heart in motion, not just words. Number three, love was the most courageous expression in the life of Jesus. I don't know if you know it, but love is the most courageous. It is the most difficult mountain to conquer. You have to be the most courageous person in the world to walk in love. It's, it's courageous. Anything else doesn't even come close to the courage it takes to love people. I know you've never been tested there, but I have. It's like, kill them now, Lord, and nuke them if you want. <laughs> and if they're in heaven, I'm, I'm going to the other place. <laughs> no, we don't say that. We don't think that. But I, maybe you have. I don't know. I've come close. But it takes, I don't know if you know that. It takes, I think it was Joy Dawson. Anybody might know who Joy Dawson is Joy Dawson in the 70s. I used to listen to her stuff. She was YWAM, I think. She was in Australia. She's she an older lady. She was an amazing teacher. And uh, she used to teach that love is always a choice. Love is not an emotion. It struck me as I was in my early 20s. When, gosh, that was a long time ago. But I was listening to a cassette. I don't know if you don't know what a cassette tape player thing is right now. It's, it's kind of like an iPhone, but not even anything close. And put it just like, and it's got a little thing, you know, it's, or, or it's an 8-track. And it was an 8-track in my Chrysler Imperial. I remember that. But, but listening to Joey Dawson, I remember sitting there 1 o'clock at night listening to her that, that love, is, love is a choice. Everything in God's kingdom is a choice. And if you're feeling driven, you're so in trouble in this life. And you'll cause a lot of trouble. And that was for me, and I knew that. And so all of these people God brought in my life weave this narrative into my life as much as God has did this too, as much as great models I've had with parents and others and et cetera. Okay. <laughs> Supernatural gifts empower, empower Jesus. Love to find him. Super, they will, oh, listen. The supernatural gifts it will empower you. And you can go around the world and you can be the biggest thing out there with the most biggest crowds in the world if you have it. Gifts, people love gifts. It will empower you. But the question is not what empowers you, what defines you as a human, as a Christian, as a person. Other, what is it that will define you that will, listen, that has enough equity to transfer into the next life? Whatever gift you have now, probably not going to be needed in heaven. When Jesus is there, first of all, there's going to be no sick, so you're out on that one. There's going to be no one to prophesy over one because prophecy has been filled on that one. It's like our gifts are for here to help each other, not there. So the only transferable thing that we can latch on to is perhaps the love of God because you're going to meet people who you didn't like down there. I'm kidding, but you know. But, but you understand, I'm not, and, and by the way, I, I, I honestly, I, I, I honestly can say, it's taken a lifetime, say, that I never preach to anyone in an audience. I am a one-man audience. I always preach to myself. I never think of anybody. I never try. I, I always, what I preach, I preach to me. And if, you, if it fits you, let the shoe fit. But, <laughs> no, and I do. And people think that. And I say, that's one thing God said in my life as a young man. You never use a pulpit ever to preach anything to anyone or to single people out or to rebuke. Or, it's, just, it's about because if I start doing that, then we're all in trouble. We all, we all get rebuked, especially me. Okay. Jesus loved large and he loved bold. Large and bold. He loved the world. He loved the church of his day. And I, I tell you what, they weren't really the church of his day. They were pretty rough. They didn't like him. They, they, tried, they finally did kill him. They wanted to kill him, and they did. He loved his mother. He loved his friends. 
He loved the disciples. He loved little children. It's just like, wow. It's just quite an amazing, amazing. He loved two thieves on a cross who one cursed him. He loved his mother enough dying on a cross that he was, his desire, the thing he had to deal with was his, John, his best friend, John, behold your mother. I mean, he's dying for the seven, and he's worried about his mother. I tell you, Jesus is amazing. We shall spend the rest of eternity learning who and what he is. And he was so concerned. In his life. And then he turns to a thief, and, and he, you know, this day will you be with me in paradise? Because he forgave unconditionally. Forgiveness that's un, that is not un, unconditional is not forgiveness. It's just an uptick in the way you feel for a moment. Forgiveness is forever. Okay, let me end that. You can never or you will never really live until you've given all your heart away. You'll never live a life that's, that's notable and God-worthy in the sense of what he designed you for. You'll never, ever live until you've given all your heart away. And you need to, and I need to, and I have prayed. And Bob encouraged me to do that. You can't die with one less or one ounce of your heart left. You have to give your heart away. Because life is about learning to give your heart away and encouraging people. I'm going to say this and we're going to close here in the conclusion. The inability, I, I, the inability to express love to people comes from a poverty spirit. I say, I say it somewhere else because that didn't work. The, let, me, let me explain. The inability to love unconditionally and to love people, anybody, whoever they are, no matter what, is a poverty of soul. It's a de deficit of spirit that cannot celebrate the life of another person who is a reflection of the uniqueness and the uniqueness of the person of God. Jesus, or excuse me, the New Testament made it clear. If you say you love God and don't love those in the image of God, you're a liar and the truth's not in you. Well, that, that one hurts. That's where Jesus took out the big stick and went like that. <laughs> if you say you love God and don't love people that he made in his image, who is all of them, then you've deceived yourself. And you have a poverty of soul. You don't have enough love of God in your life to give away. A poverty spirit is a spirit that, 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 that just, there's just no way. It can't celebrate someone else's uniqueness or difference. That's a poverty spirit. I grew up in a poverty spirit in Arkansas. And we always hated the guy with his Mercedes. Not hated, that's the wrong word. But like, look at them. Right? You know, anyway. So enough of that. So conclusion, or one of the conclusions. It's imperative that we return to our first love. It's imperative. It's so imperative that 2,000 years ago, the scripture was clear. John, the beloved, Jesus' best friend, the one he loved with all of his heart. They loved each other. They were brothers in arms, John and Jesus. That's the reason he's the only apostle that lived to be in his 90s and received the book of Revelation and a visitation from Jesus because love makes you live longer. But he wrote in that visitation from Jesus in his 90s on an island by himself in prison for the sake of the gospel. Jesus appeared to him and walked him and gave him this whole wonderful book of the book of revelations that we're still trying to figure out and fight over and doctrinize over these days and write books about and, I, you know, And 
he had a rebuke to the seven churches. There were seven branches of churches 2,000 years ago that were established in Rome and, and Corinth and different places. And, and one of the churches, he says, uh, the Lord has somewhat against you. He gave them a, a, a rebuke and a correction and also a hope and a goal for these churches. He was an apostle, the beloved of Jesus, and he had the right to do that. And he said, but you have lost your first love. Return from where you have fallen. It was a scathing rebuke. 2,000 years later, I think we're full circle, perhaps, to John's admonition to the church in Ephesus. Did I say it right? Ephesus? Where was that? Murfreesboro. How about that? <laughs> Ephesus. It sounds the same. Why? Why is it important? Let me give you this. Because love has many faces. Many faces. And I think Paul probably best gave us those faces. What does it look like? You want to know what John was talking about? How do I return to my first love? What are the faces of the love of God? What does that mean? Paul, in his writing to the first century church, said this. He laid out 16 faces of the love of God. So you're wondering, like, what do I do? How do I? I'm about to give you an exhausting homework of what it is, or what the face of the love of God is. They're going to tell you what that means for us today. Paul said this, love is patient. Oh, that wears me out right there. <laughs> love is patient. I am running low, deficit on patient right now. Love is patient. Wow. Number two. Love is kind. There's another one. I quit it too. I flunked it too. I mean, I got, I got 14 more to go. I mean, this is us. This is the church. Paul's talking to the church. John's already had uh, rebuked the church later on than, than that and telling them, you've lost your first love. Return. By the way, the word return there was a Greek military word that was used and translated into that particular language. It makes an about like, like in the arm, make an about face, no emotions required. So it's not, no, it's just correct your course. Turn the other direction. You don't, have to have, you don't have to have goosebumps to do it, but regain your first love. Because why? Here it is, the face is sorry. Love is patient. Two, love is kind. Three, love does not envy. I honestly don't know what that word means. I really mean I don't understand that word because I've never envied. People, I've never wanted to be you <laughs> or do what you do. I want to be me. I want to be the one off of never ever has lived or will live an expression of God's heart that he made me and I'm trying in my life to be who God made me be. And if I copy you, it's an insult to the creativity of a genius who made me special and you different special and you special and you special. None of his kids are the same. So, Love never envies. Love does not boast. I don't like that one. <laughs> Sometimes, because you don't call it boast. You call it encouraging yourself in front of other people. <laughs> well, it's, you know, it's just me. It's just, yeah, but yeah, I can't imagine that. I'm terrible, especially when I raised that guy from the dead yesterday. I'm really feeling bad today. Love doesn't boast, number four. Number five, love is not proud. Oh, boy. Love is not proud. Number six, oh, this is a hard one. This is another message, a whole other. Love never dishonors someone, ever. Even when you have the chance to write to or they deserve it, love does not dishonor. Number seven, Love is never self-seeking. That's another face of love. Like, I'm in this for me. Why are you in this thing? Well, not for me. Jesus' love, his life was not self-seeking. For he so loved the world, God gave him to give away himself to the world. Number eight, love is not easily angered. That one made me mad when I read that one. Mm 
love. Sorry, you have to excuse me. The Lord spoke to me as a young man and said, Larry, if you ever lose your sense of, of humor, go back to work because you'll never make it without your sense of humor. And I said, you think I'm funny, Lord? <laughs> and people have repeated this after I said it 40 years ago. Maybe the guy said them, but he said, yes, Larry, you amuse me very much. <laughs> oh, okay. Now I'll keep it up. Because at my worst time in my life, where I thought I'd done the worst, it was crazy, it was terrible, the whole bit, the Lord, I heard the Lord laughing at me. Not because he was laughing because I was so amusing. I said, Lord, I can't believe you. I've been in this terrible space. I'm not doing a good thing. And you're laughing. He said, that's because it's just amused me. You know, keep him laughing. You know, it's like. <laughs> Number nine, love keeps no records of a wrong. Oh, love has a short memory for wrongs. Love keeps no records of a wrong. Number 10, love does not delight in any kind of evil. Number 11, I like this, love always rejoices in the truth. Here's the problem. We don't know what the truth is sometimes. So we rejoice in things that are not the truth. We rejoice in untruths, false narratives. What someone said that someone said that someone said that they said. We're living in a world of false narratives. And oh my God, I don't believe anything anybody tells. I don't even believe what the devil tells me. Wait a minute, I'm supposed to not do that. But <laughs> I mean, if an angel appears to me and tells me something, I'm going to say, I'm going to test them. And say, I don't know. Do you know Michael? You know? <laughs> Number 11, <laughs> love rejoices in the truth. I'm nearly there. Number 12, love, number 12, oh, oh, oh. If we could just do this face of love, if we could just do this, love always protects. Love is a protector. Never undermines and never dis, uh, un, un, discloses or uncovers someone. Love always protects. I could tell you a story about that, but if I did, half you people in the room would be mad at me. But, 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 anyway, I'm not going to do it. I nearly did it, but I'm not going to because he's had me do things, had me protect that other people would never protect, even believe what you would protect that. You would protect what? I mean, what? Number 13, love Always trust. Oh, that's so hard. Love always leans toward trusting people will eventually get it right. Some of my worst enemies in my life when I was younger, because I have leaned into this, became my best friends and would give their life for me. Because even in their animosity toward me, I yet loved them and I yet trusted that Something in them was like God. And I had to fight courageously for their love. Fourteen, love always hopes. I like that one. So if you're out of hope this year, then you're out of love. Love always hopes. Fifteen, love always perseveres. Oh, by so if you're ready to quit, I'm up first. But if you're ready to quit, no, real love can't quit because it's a, it's, a, it's a force of courage. It's, it's a motivating force that keeps us on track, keeps us moving. Love can't quit. God has never quit. Jesus has never quit. Love never quits. And my favorite of all, 16, love never, never fails. You can't make it fail. It doesn't have a thread of failure. Love, if you love Right. If you love courageous, if you love bold, if you love when people don't love you, if you take the higher road, if you love the most, if you love, you'll never fail in anything you do. All right. That was a conclusion. Here's a final conclusion. And there's nothing beyond that, but maybe a nothing. What's going on in this world? What's going on in this nation? What's going on in the church? What's going on politically? What's going on? 
I've told you before, I'm telling you again, this year, in your lifetime, in my last time, lifetime, is the most, I don't know what to call it, year of our life. There will never be another one like it, never will come. It is a tipping point. It will change everything forever and ever this year. This year is where everything changes. Things that used to be top will be at bottom. Things that used to be right will be left, or left will be right. Things that you thought were important will not be important. And by the way, people that you see with visibility top, talking heads will no longer be, and people you never seen will be there. Things are shifting. Things are changing. And the Lord told me this 30-something years ago, Larry, there's coming a time in your older years where I'm sending the angel of the Lord, Gabriel, the war angel with a sword. He's going to take the head off of every ministry lifted up in pride. Every ministry lifted up for their own thing or doing their own or building their own deal. And he said to me, get down and get your head as low as you can get yourself. Humble yourself before God and get as low as you can get. And it took a long time. I'm still working on keeping my head down because I don't know about you, but I'm not in favor of losing my head. But there's going to be a lot of whether it be in the church, whether it be a conference, whether it be in the White House, whether it be in the church house, whether it be in the political, there's going to be a lot of heads that you see that are out there you'll never hear of ever again. And there's going to be a lot of people who have been staying low that God is going to work the scripture for they that humble themselves under the hand of God shall I exalt in due season. Everything is about to change. Everything that we know. And the choices you make and how low you get this year will determine how high you fly in the rest of your life. This is a test year. This is a year that you'll never get to redo it again and go back and I wish I had done it that year or made it. This is a year to wake up, grow up, stand up, figure out, or sit down, rather, get as low as you can get, whatever you need to do to find out, God, what is going on? What are you doing? What's next? I know there's a lot of narratives out there. This is the next move of God. It's going to be an economic move. It's going to be a political move. It's going to be uh, another renewal move. It's going to be a Jesus move. move. It's going to, like, we all got this stuff that we think is going to happen, and they're good stuff. But what is the face of the next move of God going to be? I think I know. I believe that love is the face of the next revival. Because if we have that, all the stuff we've been trying to do will just happen automatically. It'll just fall out. It'll just fall out of the box of love. We won't have to worry about prophesying because we won't keep our mouth shut because love makes you tell the truth. Love makes you encourage. Love, love uh, makes uh, healing. Love makes you care for people. Caring for people and loving people heals people. I mean, all the stuff we're working hard to do in the gift realm will just happen in the love realm. And we want to know what happened. People, when people just got close to Jesus and to Peter and his shadow, just when they touched his shadow, people were healed. He wasn't even trying to do a healing conference. Just the love of God that he carried, that Jesus gave him when he should have been slapped down for his behavior to the Lord, Jesus loved him because Jesus loves failures. Because once you fail at the bottom, there's nowhere else to go but up from there, and he's the man that helps you get out. And so here's Peter. Here, the next love, it's a Peter love. It's, it's, a, it's a James. It's a John. It's, it is a, it is a in-the-moment uh, uh, friend of God, uh, love of God, move of God that's coming. I believe the love of God will captivate the world. I do believe that. And for such a reason am I still here, in my opinion. If it is not, otherwise there will be no next move of God in our generation that will even parallel what we've had in the past. The narrative has changed. God has said, we're done. We've got to grow up, guys. This is what, this is what it's all about. This is what I sent my son for. This is what a 2,000-year-old church, and you're still in third grade and you're 2,000 years old, you need to move on and figure it out. And what we got to figure it out, I hate to say it, and I'm saying it to me, it really, in case you didn't know, it's really not all about you. I know we think it is, and, and, and there's, you know, but it is not really all about us. It is really all about what God wants and what the world needs and how God can use us when we become nothing, when we humble ourselves. If you're striving to be something, you'll spend your life trying to maintain the level of expectations you've developed about yourself. 
but you give your heart and life to Jesus and say, God, use me in whatever capacity you want to. I don't care what it is or how far you have to take me down or reduce me or put my head down into the ground. It doesn't matter. For such a reason am I on this earth is to please you and not leave this earth. I have given my heart away in any fashion or place that you want me to. I won't be measured next life by how many people I prophesied over, but by how many people I loved. Because I prophesied over people that I'd rather give them another word than the one I gave them when I was younger. Like I give you a word, the Lord says to tell you, you're done. <laughs> I mean, I've heard those kind of prophetic words. Sorry, I, I left the narrative. Let's finish here. Let me, let me finish with this one. By the way, did I tell you I did? Bob died on Valentine's Day. Isn't that amazing? I thought only Bob could pull that off. And God, I, I miss I miss him. Uh, two weeks ago, I woke up in the middle of the night. I was crying. I miss, I miss him because I don't see a lot of people like that anymore. I, I, I miss his love for people, his love for me. He never called Laura. Laura called her darling. I love that. Hey, darling. You got me from Arkansas and all to say that. But anyway, <laughs> to someone's wife. Yeah. Can I tell you just a fun story? We're ending here. This is just, just came out of nowhere. So Laura and I were doing um, at a Morningstar conference, and uh, oh, let me see, 2008 or 9. That's when God TV was big, and I was doing stuff on God TV. And God TV had all their camera work at Morningstar Ministries, and we were doing a weekly stuff, conferences. Well, God, you know, God TV was a big deal then. They're, they're no, not so much now, but back then they were. And so we had who's who prophetic there doing God TV, and. Uh, me, Bob was there, of course, and uh, Laura. Uh, I forgot what happened to her, but somehow on the way back, she ran into a door. Did something? She put she put a black ring around her eye, so she came she came with a black black eye. And so we're in the conference setting, and and I'm up to speak actually, and I'm thinking I'm not thinking about anything other than you. I'm I'm up, you know, I'm on tonight, you know, and um, and cameras are ready. It's all ready to go, and I'm, I'm ready to do what Larry used to do, and. Uh, and uh, Laura, I don't know what this happened. Laura gets up to go to the restroom, and coming back from the restroom, um, <laughs> she, he, he means, Laura, she goes, darling, what's wrong with your eye? And Laura's just being funny. She goes, oh, Larry got mad at me, hit me in the eye. <laughs> now, nobody tells me this, and, <laughs> and Laura thought, it's just an innocent, you know, Bob didn't go, ah, yeah. <laughs> And I'm ready to go preach, and I see Bob. Now, Bob's about this tall and this wide. I see Bob coming down the aisle, and I got, I'm all geared up. I'm all mic'd up, and he's walking like this. He's coming down the aisle, and he got up, and he grabbed me by the shirt of my collar right here, and he pulled me. Like I said, he had the love of God, but he hadn't quite yet refined it completely. No, no, he, he had a fierce defense for people he loved. And so he got close to me, he pulled it up there, and he pulled <laughs> my shirt up, and he, he goes, did you hit Lori? He called her Lori, not Laura. You know, I know why. You know why he called her Lori? He was a prophet. When Laura was little, her nickname, after six years, name, oh, was named Lori. And when he met her instantly, he's never called her anything but Lori. I thought that's pretty good. I thought, that's a pretty good guy. So anyway, so he goes, did you hit Lori? I said, what? Said, she got a black eye. Did you hit her? She said you hit her. I said, Bob, I didn't hit her. He said, look me in the eye, boy. Did you hit her? I said, no. He said, because you, you did. I gave you five reasons to never do that again. And he put, I go, Jesus. He was an old Marine, by the way, too. And I thought, yeah, I, I was, well, I wasn't even in the Boy Scouts, much less the Army. And he's, and I'm thinking, I don't know what to do. I love this man, but this man's going off the, he's going off the map here. Like, and he, he, like, he wouldn't let me go. He wouldn't let go of my shirt. And he'd probably go, you love me, Bob. It's me. It's me. You know, like, J -j 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 -j. But boy, was he love protects. So, so he pulls it to me and he said, he said, look me in the eye. Look me right in the eye. He's, I'm now, his nose is on my nose. I'm going, I ain't got time for this. I'm famous. I got to go do something. But no. He's nose to nose. He said, tell me the last time, did you hit Lori? I said, Bob, I would never do that. He went, okay. 
And I gotta go, I gotta go preach. Anyway. Anyway. I'm just just funny. I say that trying to close here. I say that. But anyway. But he was real too. In that way. But I'd love that about him being the defender. And he was a defender of women, by the way, especially in ministry, as I am. And as we all should be, whether it be men or women. But anyway, so Father, thank you. Um, I don't have anything to add to that other than to say that when Bob called me two weeks before he died and uh, let me know what this next move of God was about was in code words, basically. You can't stop. If you, you want to finish your course and be what God has called you to be, you can never stop loving people, Larry. And so, um, anyway, that's where we're at. And uh, we're going to, by the way, in closing here, we're going to David. Our David here is going to go back to somewhere. I don't know where you go, David, on a missionary trip. And we just want to bless you and lay hands on you. We love you. And we're going to let you go love on people that we can't reach. And we'll do that in just a second. But if you don't mind, could we just take a moment here and just maybe if you can close your eyes and we just and just give our hearts to the Lord. And I just want to speak into the atmosphere. Because if love's a tangible force, love is a tangible force, that words are motivators for that and can be and can trigger that. It's like motion activated. So love is motion activated by human words. So you motion activate. And uh, by, you know, love and motion. And so I just want to talk to the Lord and ask the Lord and, and thank the Lord and to, and, to, and to all of us together agree that this next move of God is about the love of God. It'll change everything. It'll change the world. It'll make it better. It's just, oh, Lord, give us another chance. So, Father, you are the God of love. You are the God of all things pure. The God of all things amazing. You're our father. What father doesn't love his children, even his crazy ones? You love us all. And you love us all equally. It's not one over the other. You love us. Oh, the splendor of your love is beyond comprehension on an earthly plane that we live on in this crazy flesh that we live in. There is therefore now no condemnation to any of us who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of love has set us free from the law of sin and death. And Lord, no matter how we've acted or what we've done, the bottom line is that you're in love with us. You're absolutely head over heels in love with your bride. And you love us no matter what we look like in the morning without our spiritual makeup, without our, with all of our stuff together. Without, you love us. You love your church. And you, you love all of us. And you love the world as well. Not what they do, but who you made them to become. And so, Lord, we cry out this morning for this nation, for this election, for this time, for the church house, the White House, the political house, Lord, the, the investment house, uh, the people, the, uh, the arts industry, the music, the doctors, the, everything that makes this world go around. All of, Lord, we pray that this year, this year is a transitional year. This year is a leaping off into a new dimension, a renaissance of the love of God. Lord, chasing, Lord, it doesn't have to be the end of things, and we don't have to continue as we've continued, because let love arise and let his enemies be scattered. So, Lord, we pray as the church this morning that the love of God is a narrative that will be set, and that the love of God is a worthy goal for all of us. And, Lord, we make a commitment to you this morning that we will try at least our best to try to follow that, and at least to to embrace that because that's who you are. That's your DNA. That's your nature. That's everything that you are. And so are you, the arbitrator, arbiter of love. So are you, the, uh, the, 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 the everything, the essence of love that your only son, your only, you gave him a way to be tormented because you loved us. What love you have. No man has any love like you have had, Lord, and like your son. So, Lord, we follow those footsteps, and we want to align with that this morning. And we say, Lord, as this year comes to pass, that you would send angels of the Lord to this planet, this place, angels of kindness, that you would send words of kindness, that you would send words of encouragement, that there would be visitations given to people in this room, visitations, that there would be a length of days added to the people that are sick, are people that have expiration dates in their life, that you would stretch their days, as David talked about, and God shall satisfy me with long life. 
that you will extend our lives because love extends. Love always heals. Love thinks the best. Love does the best. Love empowers. So, Lord, would you empower every cell of our bodies? Would you empower every aspect of this nation and of the world with the love of God. Lord, make a move on planet Earth this year. Make a move that will blow our socks off. Make a move that will absolutely, totally, radically revolutionize the church of Jesus Christ to the thing that you've always dreamed that we could be. You've believed in us for 2,000 years and you've never fostered and you still believe it because that's what fathers do in their children. And Lord, we're saying we are your children. Thank you for still believing in us. You will not turn this nation over to the enemy. You will not turn it over. You will not see the best uh, divorce come to pass. You are the God of the best for your children. Let this year be proven as so, Jesus. And we stand. Stand with me. And we stand. If you don't mind standing with me, we're going to pray over David. Lord, we stand with you. We stand and say together that we agree that this is the day the Lord has made. So let us rejoice and be glad in it. This is the year that you have appointed unto better things. So let us rejoice and be glad in it. Lord, not just send your love, but stir up your love in our hearts. Because all of us have that love of God. Because we are born of God. If we are born of God, then his love is resident in us. So Lord, Thank you for something new. Thank you for something wonderful, serendipitous that will come from nowhere, a serendipitous love that will cause us to be happy and rejoice. We won't see it coming. It'll just be from heaven. There will be the sound of a mighty rushing wind of the love of God. Fill this nation. Fill our lives. Fill our homes. Fill our jobs. Fill our pocket. Fill our gifting. Fill everything that we have will be transformed because of the greatest power that has ever transformed verse the universe and that is the love of God. Lord we ask for it, we beg for it, we plead for it and Lord we align ourselves with it and we say there is nothing greater, no greater ambition do we have than to love as you loved us. Lord thank you for that and Lord we put that stake in the ground in this church, in this city, and the churches in this city, in this nation, in the world we put that stake in the ground and we say Lord we know that we know that we know that you love us and we know that we know that we know that we are called to emulate you and be like you as your children. We carry your DNA. And so, Lord, whatever it takes, whatever it takes, would you adjust us? Would you woo us? Would you continue to love us? Would you continue to embrace us? Would you continue to teach us how to love? And can you continue to teach us how to walk with you in that love so that one day like Enoch, we will walk with God in love and anoint him that we're no longer here. For Enoch walked with God and he was not. Let the bad in us was not. Let the impart in us was not. Let us walk with God that who we used to be was not anymore. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, thank you for this church. Thank you for the people here in every church in this city. Thank you, Lord. We love we love, we love, we love what you love. We love what you love. Thank you, Jesus.